Good morning. I welcome all of you here this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. We're especially excited to have everybody that's here for the baptism of Amelia Rose Sutter. We're very excited to be able to uh, wash her with the waters of baptism. And uh, I'm so glad you guys are here to take part in this day of celebration. Um, if you're seated closest to the center aisle, please uh, find the fellowship pad and sign your name and pass it on to the people sitting next to you in your pew. Um, and if you're a guest or visitor, please leave some contact information on that fellowship pad as well. If you're watching online or listening on the radio, please know that you can go to stjohnsconover.com and you can download a copy of the bulletin so that you can fully take part in our worship service this morning. I want to encourage you to keep coming back in the days ahead. Lots of uh, special worship opportunities coming up, including tomorrow night. Um, we have our special annual Memorial Day uh, worship service. Uh, the Memorial Day service is a shorter service. It's going to take place outside in the amphitheater on the edge of our cemetery. Um, and we pray that you will come. You know, it used to be that Memorial Day was a day where people gathered to remember the real reason for Memorial Day. But by and large, that's been lost. It's a day of sales, and uh, it's a day, extra day off of work. It's a day to travel. But please join us tomorrow night at 7 in the amphitheater, and we'll remember what Memorial Day is really all about. Also, next Sunday is a very special day. It's going to be the day of Pentecost, and that's a special church festival. But it's also the day we're going to be celebrating Pastor Lagutin's 20th anniversary of his ordination and installation here at St. John's. For 20 years, Pastor Lagutin has been here being a blessing to us as he shares God's word and shares his love with us. So we want to encourage you to come and take part in that special service uh, next Sunday. And by the way, there's a covered dish meal in his honor after the 1030 service. So come and bring three or four dishes, especially cheeses and meats, which is on my uh, approved diet. So uh, help me out here. Uh, but that's next time. And then also in a few weeks, it's Father's Day, and we'll have a special Father's Day worship service, of course, with a special gift for all the men that are here that day. So try to make it to all those special services. Also, just a reminder, we still need a few more uh, men to volunteer to be ushers. So if you're confirmed and male, uh, probably you're ready to be an usher if you haven't begun to serve in that capacity already. Uh, next uh, week, we start taking offering like we used to for all those years, and we really need full ushering crews, so think about talking to me or to Myron Yunt after the service. Also, today is a special day because today, um, Ryan Little is here from the Gideons, and he's going to be telling us a little bit about the important work that Gideons is doing and telling us how we can be a part of that and help them in that ministry of sharing God's word with the world. So right after the service, he's going to come up and share a little bit, and there will be a door offering on your way out uh, for the work of the Gideons, so please consider making a generous donation. With those announcements, then, we begin our worship as we join together in singing the opening hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. My friends, upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father, for you live and reign with him and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. At this time, we'll join together in singing the baptismal hymn. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus. name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dearly beloved, we learn from the Word of God that from the fall of Adam, we all are conceived and born sinful, are under the wrath of God, and thus are in need of forgiveness. We would be lost forever unless delivered from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. But the Father of all mercy and grace has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, who atoned for the sin of the whole world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. To this end, our Lord commanded baptism, saying, All authority 
in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He says, furthermore, I tell you the truth, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. The holy apostles of the Lord have written, the promises for you and your children and baptism now saves you. Receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead and upon your heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. After this child, parents and sponsors, after this child has been baptized, it is your duty and privilege as parents and sponsors to remember her in your prayers, put her in mind of her baptism, give your counsel and aid that she be brought up in the true knowledge and worship of God and be taught the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. And that as she grows in years, you place in her hands the Holy Scriptures, Bring her to the services of God's house and provide for her further instruction in the Christian faith that she come to the sacrament of Christ's body and blood and thus abiding in her baptismal grace and in communion with the church, she may grow up to lead a godly life to the praise and honor of Jesus Christ. Do you promise now to fulfill these obligations? If so, then say yes. God enable you both to Will and to do this faithful and loving work and with his grace fulfill what we and you and I are unable to do. Now we ask him now to speak on behalf of your child. Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Then say, I do renounce them. I ask you therefore to profess your faith in Christ Jesus and to confess the faith of the church, the faith into which we baptize and we ask the rest of the congregation to please join us in confessing the Apostles' Creed. You can find it printed in your bulletin after the sermon, or you can find it at the back of the hymnal. We confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried, he descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of Christ. Amen. Who brings this child to be baptized? How is this child named? Amelia Rose Sutter, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, may he strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Peace be and remain with you. Amen. I now wish to, uh, to address the members of St. John's Lutheran Church um, besides the parents and godparents, we're also asking all of you to help to the best of your abilities with the encouraging Amelia Rose in her faith. So if you will take upon yourself, the, she's now part of our church family, so I'm encouraging you to take upon yourself the responsibility of loving, encouraging, including, inviting, and everything else that goes with being part of the same Christian family. Will you accept that responsibility? If so, then answer yes with the help of God. Yes, Jesus loves you, this we know, for the Bible tells us so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, 
but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. The Bible tells us so. Amen. The first reading for us to ponder this gate comes from the book of Acts, a portion of chapter 1. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount that is called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that field was called in their own language the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and... Let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of God. A second reading comes from the book of Revelation, a portion of the 22nd chapter. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruits, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Behold, I'm coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. 
He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the word of God. Please rise then for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is the gospel of the Lord. The congregation may be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a special message. Following the children's message, we'll join together in singing the sermon hymn as printed in your bulletin, Praise the one who breaks the darkness. Good morning, everybody. So what do I have up here with me? Basketball. How many of you guys like to play basketball up here? Okay, see a few hands. Now, I, I am a big basketball fan. Uh, I've loved playing since I was real little, some of your age. And uh, one of the things I really liked about basketball is as I grew older, uh, it taught me how to play on a team. Right, so on a, a basketball team, how many players are on the court together? Who knows? How many? Five, right? So a basketball game is five on five, right? Now, uh, if you got a team of players out there, uh, sometimes players don't always work well together when they're out on the court, do they? Maybe you have uh, four players that don't want to include one of their teammates on the floor, so they don't use him, they don't... Uh, pass it to him or let him get an opportunity. Are those four going to do good against the other five? No, right? They need to have all five of them together, don't they? Or maybe sometimes you have a player that's a, a bit of a ball hog and they want to dribble it everywhere and take all the shots and do all the work. Are they going to be able to compete against five players, just that one guy? No, they, they need to have everybody working together. And so on a team of, of players that really, uh, they're not perfect, Who's going to make a team like that work together really well? There's one other person we're thinking, I'm thinking about. He sits on the bench. Who, what what'd you say? A coach, right? That a coach is so important because a coach is going to get the best out of his team, isn't he? That he's going to get them to work together, that he's going to, uh, you know, if they're not, uh, everybody's not doing their parts, he's going to make sure that they do. Uh, and so a coach is so important because he can take some okay players and he can truly make them something special, right? Now, uh, in our gospel reading that we heard just a couple minutes ago, I heard a verse that I wanted to read back for you again this morning. Jesus was talking to his followers, or he was praying uh, for his followers, and he said this, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
Jesus was praying that we might all be one, that we can work together. And here's the thing is that we are not perfect people, are we? We're sinful people that we don't always get it right. But Jesus knows that when we work together, that we can do some truly amazing things. And, and he said the purpose at the end of the verse there. I don't know if you caught it. He said, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That when we work together with Jesus to uh, show his love to others, that when the world around us sees that, when they see Christ's love through us, that they may come to, to know Jesus too, to know his love for them, and they may have faith as well, right? And so God wants us to work together so that others can see his love in us and they can come to know him too. So why don't we pray, and we'll thank God for making us one. We'll ask him to help us to share that love, okay? So will you pray with me? I'll say a line, and you can repeat it back after me, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you so much for making us one. Help us to share your love so that others may come to know you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming up. You can head back to your seats. Evil swept through Uvalde. A reporter quoted Texas Governor Abbott, and then at the conclusion of that report, well, we don't know what the motive was. 
It's hard for a human mind to make that connection, to understand that the underlying reason for violence, hate, racism, really any kind of conflict is evil. That's the motive. And because we don't understand it, it's hard for a humanist mind to properly understand what needs to be done. It's a very humanistic idea that we can solve the world's problems. We can save the world. If we make good enough laws, maybe strike down the bad laws that we don't like, come up with new policies, we can save the world. There's still one problem, evil exists. But our modern world depersonalizes evil. It disconnects evil from person. Instead, we speak of tools and means and weapons that kill people, whether it's guns or, as you think about what's happening in Ukraine right now, missiles, bombs. We talk about the motivation for violence and hate, whether it's racism, uh, political ideology, imperialism, religious extremism, or maybe it's something personal, you know, personal vendetta. And so we think we can fix those issues as if uh, those issues are kind of like on their own, their own entity issues, disconnected from the person. Once again, we depersonalize evil. Yet the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Evil is always personalized because it is person who is evil. Not a tool, not a law, not a gun or a missile or a bomb. It's the person. Which brings us to the scary stark realization while the images of evil perpetrated in Texas or in Ukraine or any other place around the world, they shock us and they grieve us. We perceive them as somewhat distant from us. But because evil is personalized, it's connected to a person, and there's persons everywhere, right? Right? Evil is not far from us. It's very close. In fact, it's pretty scary how close it gets. Now, it doesn't make the news, the evil that's all around us. But I can assure you that there's no less evil in this community than in all the faraway places that do make the news. And that's about the only difference. Because most of us don't hear about all the domestic violence and drugs and rape and assaults. And I can assure you that you probably don't want to hear all about those things, especially things that involve young children very evil, sexual abuse and things like that. You just don't want to know about this. It's just too hard. But you know what? It happens all the time. And until it touches you personally, when evil sweeps through your life and leaves you or your loved one a victim or even a casualty, then you will understand 
But there's even more. If evil is personalized, then we're not merely witnesses or even victims of evil. Each person, every one of us, has that internal problem of the human heart. Thus, everyone is inherently, every one of us is not only capable of evil. Now, while there's a place for political, legislative, police, or military means to confront evil, they can only do so much. You know, you can ban all the guns in the world and someone will use another weapon or not even a weapon at all to kill again. And you can come up with any other issues because it is about evil. And you cannot ban evil. You cannot legislate evil out of the heart of a person. That's the message of the church. Evil is not depersonalized. Evil is not disconnected from the person. People, you and I, are the problem. We always have been. It's all about our internal stuff, our heart, not about the externals, the tools, the weapons, the policies, the laws. This is about far more than legislation, terrorism, racism, imperialism, militarism, and the like. It's about the evil of the human heart, the sinful human heart. Sin is what brings about conflicts and hate and anger and rape and abuse, and violence. Now, we were not created to be like that, to hate, to kill, to fight, and to abuse each other. We were made to be at peace with one another because we were made to be one, united. Adam and Eve were one with each other because they were made to be one with God in the beginning until sin entered the picture and separated them from God. Remember, the first result of the sin of Adam and Eve was that they attempt to run away and hide from God because they could no longer be one with God. Their relationship was torn apart. Their sin put a wall of separation between them and God. And as a result, they became at odds with each other. Immediately, they started blaming each other. They tried to pass the buck. They disagree. They fight. And it didn't take long for that disagreement, that separation, that fight to escalate and to bring it to the ultimate level of separation when two people disagree one of them kills the other one and that's what happened when Cain killed Abel destroying the unity that they should have had because they were brothers gone is the brotherly love and that's what sin does it can destroy even the strongest bond Sin is the opposite of oneness, of unity. It brings about division and destruction and separation. It destroys the wholeness. It shatters the harmony. This is what causes fights and violence and abuse. Now, it doesn't always take on the form of physical stuff. But it still works on emotional and spiritual, psychological, you name it, level. Pride puts you on a pedestal, thinking that you're above everybody else. And uh, 
And in the process, you're going to knock down everybody else to build yourself up. Greed will get you worried about yourself only. And you will ignore everybody else. Lust is about satisfying yourself at the cost of others. And it's, name it, all the sins. They ruin your relationships, the ties that unite you with others in no time. And far worse, sin is what separates you from God. It keeps you unholy. And you have to run away from God because when you are unholy, you cannot be one with your holy God. And if you cannot be one with him, all that is left is the ultimate eternal separation of death and hell. And understand that's the purpose of Satan. That's why he started up the whole thing. To separate you from each other and to separate you from God. To separate you from eternal life. That's what he did with Adam and Eve. And that's where he is going with you. But despite all the efforts of the evil one, we're still the body of Christ. It's interesting to see that as a result of tragic events, people respond with gathering together and praying and singing hymns. And so in this congregation right here and around the world, you will see this miraculous gathering of people with a variety of ages, backgrounds, professions, personal preferences. We all come together voluntarily. But there's more. It is the Lord himself who has gathered you together. And it is he who keeps you together, who keeps you one. And he does it. And he tells you all about it in our text for today. Jesus said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may also be one, as just you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that I, you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. In his prayer, Jesus calls you those who will believe in me through their word. And the word has been proclaimed to you. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. By his word, God has called you to be his child, to be one with his body and one with him. By his word, God still gathers you together and keeps you together as one. Jesus continues, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one as, even as we are one. Now, what is this glory that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about his cross, his death, and his resurrection. Listen to Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Did you catch all those words? United and glory and resurrection and baptism and death and new life. In other words, you are one with Christ through your baptism. 
He has joined you to himself, to his death and to his resurrection. Without that, you would have to die for your sin. You would have to be isolated from God forever. But because he has shared his glory of the cross with you, you're now one in him. As one, therefore, we come together to confess our sin, the very evil that separates us from each other and makes us hurt and harm each other. And as one, we receive the absolution. And in that forgiveness, we are reconciled with God and we're reconciled with one another. As one, we gather together at the altar to receive the body and the blood of Christ. And not only we confess the unity, being of one confession, being of one faith, we actually come together with the angels and the archangels and the company of heaven on the other side of the altar, including all the saints, all the faithful Christians who died but who are alive in Christ, with whom we are physically separated now, but we're still one with them. And one glorious day, we will live forever in the new heavens and the new earth. Remember the reading from the book of Revelation for today? We're one. It is sin that separates us from each other. It is sin that causes the stuff that human minds cannot figure out what causes it. It causes us to be separated from each other and from God and brings about conflicts and fights and violence and abuse and hatred and all the other evil. You, it's hard for us to think about, but it's there. And you and I and really nobody else, no laws, no police, no military, no presidents, no anybody, we cannot overcome this evil. It's just there. But Christ has it is in him that you and I find reconciliation with each other and with God. It's only because of him you can be sure of this. You are one with Christ, with his body, the church, and his word and his glory are all summed up in these words to you. You are one with God because you are forgiven of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the last time, I think, we need to make this announcement that uh, donations can be made online, stjohnsconover.com, donate, or you can drop them off as you exit. Otherwise, we're going to move on now, and we'll sing for all the saints, verses 1 through 5.
we stand now for prayer. O righteous Father, your Son obeyed your holy will for the sake of our salvation. Through your Spirit, give your church on earth unity of faith that the world may know that you sent your Son to rescue us from sin and death and the power of the devil and the violence and hatred. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have instituted holy baptism as a saving flood, a washing of rebirth and renewal. Grant that many would be washed in the river that flows from the heavenly city and be brought through her gates into the communion of your church. We praise you for the new life that was given today in the baptism to Amelia Rose. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of the church, you have sustained your people through the ages by the apostles' witness to the death and resurrection of your Son. Raise up from among us faithful pastors in every age. Keep our missionaries, pastors, and overseers faithful to you in all things. We pray thus especially today for Incarnate Word Lutheran Church in Florence, South Carolina. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon this nation. Grant us a long memory to recall those who gave the full measure of devotion to our, to our country's peace and security. Bring to mind the sacrifices of those who served faithfully until death in the protection of our freedom and in the defense of our land. We pray also for those who keep peace at home now, our law enforcement officers and those who defend us from the enemies around the world our military, including Justin Miller, Bradley Hatley, Austin Elander, Nathan Reitzel, Austin Bandy, Jake Bandy, Morgan Bassett, Landon Trivet, Evan Mojica, Derek Smith, and Jake Pippen. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Eternal Lord, you have seated Christ at your right hand for our deliverance. Remember all who are afflicted with illness, who suffer and who mourn. We pray for Chuck Bolliger, Michael Sigmund, Dennis London, Peggy Polomsky, Jeff Watson, Jack Smith, Aiden Cox, Phyllis Bumgarner, Cindy Eckert, Kim Ramsey, Jim Wesson, Barry Lynch, Tanya Lambert, Tracy Boston, Lewis Holler, Melissa Goble, John Sigmund, Vanessa Travis, Barney Barnett, Geraldine Hahn, Bob and Martha Bumgarner, Philip Osborne, A.C. and Rosalie Yant, Jason Sigmund, Lynn and Leroy Lael, Phil... Johnson, George Huffman, Bill and Shirley Rocket, Betty Boston, Tina Parkhurst, Davis Reese, Becky Ramsey, Pam Walker, Alex Yant, Cameron Yant, Russell Sigmund, Tommy Huffman, Linda Mundy, Shelby Knipe, Libby Witherspoon, Christopher Sigmund, E.J. Lyles, David Lynn Good, Donna Jones, Diane Poovey, Randall Lee Hollifield Jr., Sarah Knipe, Dennis Blevins, Deborah Bailey, Chris Sigmund, Kathy Wallace, Lane Baker, Kristen Sigmund, Billy Baumgartner, Shawnee Mitchell, Pat Cray, Judy Goble, Janet White, Joyce Waters, the family and friends of Herman Phillip who passed away earlier this week. Give them health and strength and comfort according to your will. Sustain them in faith, knowing that for Jesus' sake you will raise them in glory on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we do with those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And we sing the remainder of For All the Saints.
Please take a seat for a brief uh, Gideon's presentation. Good morning. I'm Ryan with Gideon's International. I'm just going to take a couple minutes to explain what the Gideons are. And uh, first off, I want to give you a testimony about a man and his wife. The man's name was Rocky. He and his wife had lost their son at the age of 17. Could you imagine losing a child at the age of 17? Anybody here ever lost a child, had to bury a child? No, I don't believe any parent should ever have to bury their own child. But here, Rocky and his wife has lost their child. And for a long time, they avoided going into this child's room and cleaning it up. Because could you imagine going into that room? Every item in that room would remind you of that loss and bring that hurt back. Well, they finally got up the courage one day, and they, they went to that room. I could imagine that the tears started flowing from the time they turned that doorknob they went into that room, but God had a treasure in that room for them because while they were searching that room, they came across the nightstand, and on the nightstand was a little testament like this, and they thumbed it open, and at the very back, it says, confessing to God that I am a sinner and believing that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross and was raised for my justification I do now receive and confess him as my personal Savior. And their son had signed that line, confessing his sins and accepting Christ like a contract. He said, I'll believe you by faith if you'll cover me with your blood. And this is the goal of the Gideons. The goal is to bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through associating together and uh, the delivery of God's word but we can't do it alone we rely on our local churches to do this ministry we ask that the churches pray for the Gideons we ask that the men of the churches consider joining the Gideons some of our best Gideons are Lutheran men we you, we need desperately men in the Gideon ministry to do this work the Gideons are just an, an extension of your church's ministry arm. Where you can't go, the Gideons are already there. They don't have to be flown there. They're already there. All over the world, there are Gideons ready to distribute God's word. Do you know that every five days, one million copies of God's word are handed out individually by Gideons around the world? That's a lot of scriptures. That's a lot of people being told of God's love each week. And we can't do it alone. And we need the support of the churches. Each testament costs $1.25. And each of these Bibles, which you find in hotel rooms, cost $5. And Jesus said, don't store up treasures on earth where you'll lose it. You know, moth and rust will destroy it. But store up treasures in heaven where you can't be taken away from you. Jim Elliott put it a different way. He said, a man is no fool to give what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And I ask that you consider supporting the Gideons through your giving, through your prayers, and through your time. I could stand here all day telling you testimony after testimony from CVCC, Lenore Ryan, the fairgrounds, the flea market of people that have come to Christ because a Gideon was willing to take a scripture and give a word of testimony. I've led many to Christ. I've had that privilege and opportunity. And I want to tell you of one in closing. We were at the Hickory Fairgrounds one year and we, we pass out scriptures every year at the fairgrounds. And one night, it was a Friday night, and it was a busy night. We were sitting there handing out scriptures. People were coming by. I was, I was handing them out as quick as I could. 
quick as I could pull them out of a box. Ma'am, would you like scripture? Sir, could you, would you like a copy of God's word? Well, this one lady came by. Ma'am, would you like a copy of God's word? She took it. And right behind her was her little eight-year-old, little girl. And the little girl, it's like, to me, it seemed like time froze. The little girl looked at me expectantly, like, do you have one of those for me? I said, young lady, would you care for a copy of God's word? And she smiled. I'm telling you, there is not an angel in heaven that could smile like that little girl smiled. And I handed that scripture to that little girl. She took it and scurried off after her mother. I didn't think much of it, continued tonight. Later, my wife said, I want you to see something. She's on Facebook. And on Facebook, there was a story of a little girl who had went to the fair. And it wasn't the, the rides or the funnel cake or the hot dogs that had so impressed that little girl. It was the fact that she had received a little Bible. And on the ride home, she said, Mama, now that I have a Bible, can we go to church? And the picture on Facebook was of that little girl and her mother sitting in a church service. That little girl has come to Christ. Her mother has straightened her life up, has come to Christ, and that little girl has even brought her friends to Christ. I handed that little girl a scripture, but I didn't purchase it for her. Someone in a church service like this felt a desire to give towards the Gideons to purchase a scripture that made it available to that little girl. I don't know who it is. You all don't know who it is. But I tell you, somebody does. That's God Almighty. And in the last days, God will reward that person. Once again, don't store up treasures on earth. Store them up in heaven. And one way is to find a ministry that is trying to push the gospel. And the Gideons are 100% of your funds goes towards the purchase of scriptures and delivering. You, it don't, none of the money comes to me. It don't go to paying for plane fares, gas. It 100% goes towards the purchase of these scriptures. So I thank you for your time. And once again, Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Lil, and uh, you can uh, share God's peace, and the door offering is on your way out.